everyone. Thank you for participation so far in this part of the worship service. I mentioned you know, how I was excited about this prayer team when we got started. I want you to know that right now there are members of that prayer team that are praying for you. During this service, that God would speak to you and that God would speak through His Word and would help you here today. So uh, prayer is such a vital part to the life of a Christian and uh, we want to encourage more of it. Uh, in our church and as we pray together. So if you're looking for a prayer partner to pray with after the service, I really encourage you to be with the ladies over here in the choir room or the men over in the ad to room. Okay, with that said, I'm excited about today's message because I love stories of inspiration. Stories of people that have overcome trials and received the victory. And, and I'm a sucker for these. You see them, you know, if you're on Facebook, if you're on social media, you get these shared a lot. And, and I love seeing these stories. Uh, this one right here, this little girl, her name's Addie Clarkson. I don't know if y'all saw her story this week or not. Uh, Addie is eight years old, and she is blind. But yet she was asked to sing the national anthem at the Louisville women's basketball game on Thursday against UConn. And they had 17,000 people there, and she sang the national anthem. And I love her attitude towards all this. It says, what some saw as an impairment, Addie uses to her advantage. She says, well, I'm blind, so I can't see the 17,000 people that I'm singing in front of, so I don't get nervous. Her mom is, is recounting, she says, after she's done singing, and the roar of the crowd, just the smile that comes on her face, it inspires her. She receives a standing ovation. And she says, that's, that's my favorite part, the smile on my little girl's face. She said, I want her to know, my mom says, I want her to know that she can do anything that someone who can see can do. It might look a little different, but she can overcome. And I love stories like that. I love the inspiration of people that have faced challenges, trials, and have received their, their victory, their triumph over it. And so today, as we're talking about Abraham, we're looking at the defining moment of Abraham's life. It's in Genesis chapter 22. As Abraham faces trial and triumph in his test. His test with his son Isaac. So let's pray together and then we'll dive right into God's word. Would you please bow with me? Lord, we are so thankful for today. We're thankful that you give us these great examples in scripture and in our own life of overcoming the trials of life through faith. So God, I pray that each one of us, in whatever trials we're facing today, that we faced in the past, or that we're going to face in the future, that you would give us the strength of our faith to overcome, to keep our eyes focused on you, so that we too can have the victory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now as so we're going to be looking at Genesis chapter 22, go ahead and turn there. We'll be just going through most of that chapter here today and looking at the testing that Abraham undergoes as he faces his trial and... At the end, he gets his triumph. But before we go too far into this, I think it's important that we need to identify we all go through trials in life. And sometimes those trials, they kind of come because of our own doing. And sometimes they come out of nowhere. So it's important to realize that there are times where we can sort of be the cause of our own trial. If we've got sin, if we've got bad attitudes, if we've made poor decisions, foolish decisions, sometimes you have to pay the consequences of that. Now, Jesus, through his blood, can take away any sin. He can wash us clean and make us in a right standing with God. But in this world, there are still sometimes consequences that we have to face. I believe that the, the murderer on death row can be forgiven and be made a child of God, but there are still consequences for that sin. So, as we look at Abraham's trial this morning, we have to realize that his trial, though, wasn't a punishment for him. This wasn't because he'd sinned and he had made a bad choice or that God was, was trying to teach him a lesson or trying to punish him. No, this was actually a test of his faith. We're going to look at what that means. Go ahead and look at verse 1. After these things, God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, here I am. Now, right off of get, right at the beginning, we see that God is testing Abraham. God is not tempting Abraham. There's an important distinction here. Some people think of testing and temptation as being the same thing, but that's not the case. 
Um, there is a difference. You see, Satan tempts us to bring out our worst. God tests us to bring out our best. Satan tempts us to bring out our worst. God tempts us to bring out our best. James chapter 1, verse 13 through 15 says, When we're tempted, no one should say that God is tempting me. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt any person. But each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their own evil desires and enticed. Then after desire is conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it's fully grown, gives birth to death. You see, temptation comes from our own sinful desires, our sinful nature, our lusts of the flesh. And Satan preys on those. He, he lays traps for us. He tries to get us to stumble. He prowls around like a roaring lion, the scripture tells us. And he tries to entice us, but ultimately... The responsibility for our sin falls on ourselves. We can't say, well, the devil made me do it. It's not really my fault. No, when we choose to do wrong, or when we choose not to do the good that we're supposed to do, then the responsibility does fall on us, and there are consequences there. Temptation leads to sin, which leads to death. And that is for our destruction, for our worst. But God doesn't test us for our worst, he tests us for our best to help our faith, to help us to grow. In fact, James also tells us in chapter 1, verse 2, Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know the testing of your faith produces perseverance. And let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. God tests us to make us stronger. To help our faith grow, to bring about a better result for us. God is not tempting us. God is not tempting Abraham, and he's not punishing Abraham. He's trying to bring about something bigger. Something that will bring him glory. And what is it? Back to Genesis chapter 22, verse 2 and 3. God says, take your son your only son, Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains that I shall tell you. So Abraham rose early in the morning, saddled his donkey, and took two of his young men with him and his son Isaac. He cut the wood for the burnt offering, and he arose and went to the place of which God had told him. There's a lot going on just right here. God tests Abraham by giving up his son Isaac as a sacrifice. Now Isaac foreshadows Jesus in many ways. We're going to talk about that in a few minutes. But one thing I love here is the language that God uses to describe Abraham's relationship with Isaac. He says, take your son, your only son, whom you love. The same words that he uses to describe Isaac God himself later says about his son, Jesus. When Jesus is baptized, he says, This is my son, my only son, whom I love. In him I will please listen to him. So God describes Isaac and Abraham's love for him in the same way that he describes his love for Jesus. Abraham loved Isaac. There is no question about that. But yet the task that God asks him to do is one that I can't imagine ever being asked to do. And in fact... At that time, Abraham only had a, a, a limited understanding of who God was. What he did know, he trusted. And so as we find out later on, God hates things like innocent people suffering. He hates human sacrifice. But Abraham might not have known these things at that time. But he did know that God was good and God had commanded him to do something. So look how Abraham responds to that. He gets up early in the morning and makes preparations to go. Now, I don't know about you, I'm not a morning person. And even if I'm like, if I'm excited and I'm like ready to go and I'm ready to do something, I can get up and I can get myself ready, but I tend to be still kind of slow. <laughs> but if I have to get up and do something that I'm dreading doing, I mean, it's like pulling teeth to get me out of bed. I, I make up any excuse that there is in the world to, to waste time. And I, if I don't want to do something, I'm not going to be jumping up at the crack of dawn to go do it. And Abraham was just asked to sacrifice his only son, and his response is to get up 
first thing, make all the preparations and go. I would have at least said, hey, God, wait a minute, can we talk about this in the morning? You know, let, let, let's come back to this in the morning after we've had some time to, to think and pray about it a little bit. But no, Abraham responds immediately. And there's an important principle here. When we face trials of any kind, it's important that we can overcome those trials with obedient faith. Obedient faith. We can overcome our trials with obedient faith. So, when you're facing a trial the next time, ask yourself, is there something that God's Word speaks directly to you? Is there an example from Scripture of someone who went through a similar circumstance that I can look to and I can obey, I can follow what God's Word says? Or is there someone that I know in our church or in our life that's been through a similar circumstance that I can go and I can talk to and I can learn from their example and I can become obedient to it as well? Or maybe it's just simply do the thing that God called you to do last. The last time you felt like God called you to do something. The last time you heard from God. Then the last thing you knew, you should have done it, but you didn't. Go back and do that. And maybe that will lead you to overcome the trial that you're currently going through. You see, many times our trials are actually wake-up calls to our faith. Maybe we've gotten complacent. Maybe we've gotten lazy. Maybe we've just been distracted by things and we come across a hardship that God wants to use to spur us in our faith, spur us on in our faith. Maybe it's actually a wake-up call, the trial that you're going through right now. Let's continue reading in verse 4. On the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place that was from afar. Then Abraham said to his young men, Stay here with the donkey. I and the boy will go over there and worship and come again to you. Now, if you make notes in your Bible, if you highlight or if you star things or write and underline, underline verse 5. Because verse 5, there is so much powerful truth there in verse 5. Abraham says to his young men, stay here with the donkey. I and the boy are going to go and worship. Worship. Now what was he going to do? He was going to go sacrifice Isaac. That's what he was called to do. But Abraham doesn't describe it as sacrifice. He says it's worship. I and the boy are going to go over there and worship. You see, true worship involves sacrifice. It's important that sacrifice be a part of our worship. Now I'm not talking about animal sacrifice. We're not going to have an altar to animals or anything like that up here. Jesus took all the animal sacrifice and he put an end to that on the cross. He paid our sin once and for all. But what is sacrifice? We talked about it a little bit earlier. It's an act of giving up something of value for something that you regard as more valuable. I was joking with Ryan Childers this week because he posted that on his Facebook on Friday. And I was like, man, you're stealing my thunder talking about sacrifice. But this is something we need to realize as a church. We need to be sacrificing when we come to worship. Again, I don't mean animals. I mean with our attitudes, with our lifestyles, with our hearts. God wants us to sacrifice. The primary purpose of the temple and the tabernacle in the Old Testament wasn't singing. It wasn't even teaching. The main purpose of the temple and the tabernacle in the Old Testament was to offer sacrifices to God. Now what does that look like for us today? The sacrifice should still be a part of our worship, but we often treat worship as if it's all about us. We come and say, you know, Scott did okay today, but you know, it didn't really speak to me this morning. Or the music, okay, yeah, I don't, I don't know, I just, I didn't really get a lot out of that church service today. Maybe it's not really for me. I need, I need to find a place that, that's more of my style. I mean, we say that. I've said that. We've said that before. But worship isn't about us. It's about God. Amen. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 15 and 16 says it like this. Through Jesus, therefore, let us continually offer to God the sacrifice of praise, the fruit of lips that openly profess His name. And do not forget to do good and to share with others. For such sacrifices, God is pleased. So what does it mean to sacrifice? It means that everything we do, from our words, to our thoughts, to our service, to our thanksgiving, 
our kindness to others, the money that we give, the songs that we sing and praise, the confession that we make, our hearts, our emotions, the things that we remember like his sacrifice on the cross, everything, the things that we learn, the things that we do, who we are, can be an offering of sacrifice and praise to God. And that's what he desires from his people, is that heart of sacrifice. Abraham said, we are going to worship. But then he said, we're going to return. He said, I am the boy. We're going to return. Don't miss this. Abraham knew he was going to go sacrifice his son Isaac, but he also knew that the two of them were going to come back. I don't know how he knew other than faith. He trusted in God. We're going to talk about that in just a minute here. But he knew that he and Isaac were returning. Genesis chapter 22, verse 6. And Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering, and he laid it on Isaac his son, and he took his hand in his hand the fire and the knife. So they went both of them together, and Isaac said to his father Abraham, My father. And Abraham said, Here I am, my son. And Isaac said, Behold, there, here's the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? And Abraham said, God will provide for himself the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. So they went, both of them, together. <clears throat> what if one of the reasons for Abraham's trial wasn't really about Abraham? What if one of the reasons that Abraham faced this trial was actually for Isaac? Because at this time, biblical scholars, they think Isaac's anywhere from 15 to 37 years old. He's not a young boy. Which means that Abraham is anywhere from 115 to 137 years old. Now, if Isaac wanted to, he could overpower his dad. If Isaac wanted to, he could just run away. He didn't have to go through with this. He didn't have to carry the wood for his own sacrifice in this. And when he asks Abraham, where's the lamb? Abraham says, the Lord will provide. He points him back to God. <laughs> Abraham, I think, knew this principle. This principle that when it comes to facing trials, our response influences the faith of others. Our response influences the faith of others. He wanted to instill his faith into his son Isaac. See, at this point, God was the God of Abraham. But God needed to be the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, and all of Israel. And in order for that to happen, Isaac needed to see Abraham's faith played out. Abraham needed to demonstrate in his, that his faith in God was real. <laughs> Parents, let me speak to you for just a second. As one of you all, parents, we have the biggest responsibility. We are the number one influence on the faith of our children. Absolutely. Teachers, they play a role. Sunday school teachers, youth leaders, coaches, they can all play a little role, but hands down, the number one influence on a child's faith is their parents. Here's a statistic here. And this is actually the Huffington Post posted this. Parents that have little to no importance on their faith. If a child grows up in a home that there's basically no, nothing really talked about, about their faith, no importance. Only 1% of kids raised in a home like that will have faith in their 20s. But if faith is important in the home, if both parents are modeling faith, if they're having discussions about faith, they're sharing their faith, reading scripture, involved in church, 82% of kids will have a strong faith. A commitment to a church that will be growing in their faith in their 20s. Now that means there are still many that aren't. But 82% versus 1%, even if there's just one parent that's active in their faith that's trying to instill faith in their child, the percentage is greater than 50% that that child will continue in faith. We have an important role to influence the next generation. Grandparents should play a role in that as well. The value of living out your faith actively 
and passing it on to the next generation cannot be exaggerated. And I think Abraham knew that. Abraham knew that he needed to prove that his faith in God was true to Isaac. Let's continue in verse 9. When they came to the place that God had told them, Abraham built the altar there and laid the wood in order and bound Isaac his son and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Remember, Isaac's anywhere from 15 to 37 years old at this time. <laughs> then Abraham reached out his hand, took the knife to slaughter his son. Oh, wait a minute. This is difficult to read. I don't know how anybody could do that. Honestly. It, it, it's a difficult passage of scripture. Abraham is willing to sacrifice his own son. Too many times people have looked at a verse like this and they've used it as an example of maybe abusing your children or treating them poorly or even worse. I think what's important to realize at this point is that God hadn't revealed truths about himself to Abraham that we now have today. Like I said earlier, God hates the innocent lives being uh, harmed. He hates human sacrifice. These kind of things Abraham might not have known at that time. He came from a culture that worshiped many gods. So he might not have known that at that time. But what Abraham did know was that God was faithful to his promise. And God had promised him that Isaac would be his son, and through him all the world would be blessed. Look at Hebrews chapter 11, <coughs> verse 17 through 19. By faith, Abraham, when God tested him, offered Isaac as a sacrifice. He who embraced the promises was about to sacrifice his one and only son, even though God had said to him, it is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. Now here, this is important. This is where the New Testament helps us understand the Old. It says, Abraham reasoned that God could even raise the dead. We talked about that last week. God, Abraham believed that God could raise the dead. So, in a manner of speaking, he did receive Isaac back from death. Abraham had no doubt because he believed so strongly that God was faithful to his promise and that God had promised him Isaac would be his son and that he would have generations through Isaac. He said, okay, whatever you ask me to do, you're not going to break your promise, God. So I'm going to do it and I'm going to trust that you're going to come through. So Abraham obeyed. He believed so strongly in God that he followed through with it. He was 100% convinced that God was good and that God was good to his promises. And you know what? We can be 100% convinced of that today. Because what does God do? Verse 11. But the angel of the Lord calls out to him from heaven and says, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, here I am. He said, do not lay your hand on the boy or do anything for, to him. For now I know that you fear God. And seeing that you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. See, God didn't desire the death of Isaac. God desired the heart of Abraham. And whatever trial you're facing, or that you're going to face, or that you have faced in the past, it's your heart that God wants. God desires our hearts too. Verse 13, so Abraham lifted up his eyes and he looked and behold, behind him was a ram caught in the thicket by his horns. And Abraham went, took the ram and offered it up as a burnt offering instead of his son. Underline instead. So Abraham called the name of that place the Lord will provide. And as it is said to this day, on the mount of the Lord, it shall be provided. This ram that's provided here is the beginning of one of the most important doctrines in all Scripture. It's the doctrine of substitutionary atonement. And what does that mean? Big word. Big churchy word. It means a life for a life. In order for a life to be saved, a life has to be given. And this ram was given in place of Isaac. But this ram and then the sacrifices that came afterwards were not enough to fully pay the debt. Ultimately, it points to the Lamb. 
Abraham said, the Lord himself will provide a lamb. And he did in Jesus. Jesus is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Remember I said that Isaac and Jesus are similar. Both Isaac and Jesus were promised sons. Both Isaac and Jesus were miraculously born. Both were offered up as a sacrifice and both were raised from the dead. Isaac, figuratively speaking, as we heard back in Hebrews, Jesus literally speaking. And from this passage of Scripture, a Hebrew proverb was developed. And the proverb simply says this, On the mount, the Lord provides. On the mount, the Lord provides. Now often when we think of being on the mountain top, we think of like a high, like a mountaintop experience, like going to camp or a retreat or having this really awesome experience with God. We think of it as, as this good thing, but have you ever tried to climb a mountain? If you're just trying to climb a really tall flight of stairs, it's hard, isn't it? I mean, you get exhausted, you get tired, you, you, the higher you get, it's colder, the, the air is thinner, it's, it's a challenge. And what this proverb means, it's not talking about on the mountaintop where you're, you know, you're really good on your faith. This is talking about when your struggle becomes so hard that it's at the pinnacle. When your circumstance in life is the point where you're just hanging on by a thread. When it's almost enough to cause you to lose faith. If you hold on to your faith, the Lord provides. On the mount, the Lord provides. <coughs> this mountain where Isaac was to be sacrificed is the same mountain that the temple was built on. This mountain is the one that's being fought over right now between Jews and Muslims where the Dome of the Rock and the Temple Mount is. And just outside of this mountain, just the same mountain range is where Golgotha was, where Jesus was sacrificed. So very literally speaking, on the mount, the Lord did provide. He provided salvation to all of us through Jesus Christ. But He also provides for our personal mount. The struggles that we each face. You see, every person who has a strong faith has had that faith tested. And that's what we see here with Abraham. This is the defining moment of Abraham's life. Was how he faced this trial. And you know what? Your defining moment might come when you're facing a trial. How do you respond to faith? God tests us to make us better. He wants us to grow and be stronger in our faith. And if you're facing that defining moment today, I just encourage you, walk by faith. Turn to Him in faith. And on the mountain the Lord provides. I'll close with this scripture. James chapter 1 verse 12. Blessed is the one who perseveres on the ground. Because having stood the test, that person will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love Him. Have you received that promise today? Do you know that for those who love the Lord, like the scripture we read at the beginning, that God is working in all things, in all things, for our good. It doesn't mean everything's good, but He's working in all things for our good. You know you can trust in Him today. And if you haven't made that first time decision for Him, you can do that today as well. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do thank You that You are the one in whom we hope. You are the one who helps us to overcome. You're the one who provides on the mountain. You're the one who gives us triumph over our trials. And so God, for each one of us that's facing a test right now, we pray for Your strength. And we pray for fresh eyes to see where you are working to shape and mold us. That we can become better, stronger, and more faithful through it. And that we can pass on faith to others as they witness our response to life's trials. So God, please, please help us. And especially today, if there's someone who needs an extra measure of your strength. Would you give that to him here today? 
And if there's anyone here that needs to turn their life over to you for the very first time, would you convict them and move them? Because it is through you that we have victory. And apart from you, we have nothing. It's in you we hope, in Jesus' name. Amen.